I'd like us to read together the scriptures. Ready? Go. Then Then I saw saw a new new heaven heaven and and a new new earth, earth, for the the first first heaven and the first first earth had had passed passed away, and and there there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming coming down down out of heaven heaven from God. God. Why am I reading by myself? They're ahead of us. They're they're done. (laughs) Okay, I saw. He went to sleep just like that. He was caught up in a dream. That's what happened. Verse 2. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I did did not not see see a temple temple. in the city because it was not on the screen. (laughs) (laughs) It's there now. It's there now. I did not see a temple temple in the the city because because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Do you know this song? It's called, He the Pearly Gates Will Open. So, um, we'll see if we can sing it together. Like a dove when hunted fried. 
is a great old hymn. Yes. Tremendous theology. Uh, and here's an old throwback as well. Uh, maybe um, heaven. So some of you need to sing heaven and sustain it. And let the altoads, which is just like the altoads, except they're more froggy. <laughs> altoads, let the altoads sing happy home above. So melody line, somebody. Heaven. Happy home above. it up. Everybody can sing every word, but somebody still needs to keep the harmony. So we're all going to sing together and you can sing as many as you like. <laughs> words, notes, songs, whatever. You mean I can jazz it up? You can jazz it up. Oh, I don't know that I can do that. <laughs> Um, well, maybe I'll just wait. <laughs> Great. Get us quiet and then make I'm us Sorry, my, I'm so bad. <laughs> Go ahead and talk. <laughs> soon and very soon. We are going to see the king. Oh, soon.
been um, an observation, I'll just say it, an observation of mine, but others have noticed that uh, church songs of the not necessarily so distant past, it's not so old that I can't remember it, <coughs> the songs all used to be about heaven. Anybody recall that? What are the songs about today? If you go to uh, pick a church, there's one in this corner, one on the next corner, one on that corner, one on that corner, one down another block from that corner, uh, two blocks down on that corner, two blocks this way. There's three churches meeting over here in the memorial building. What What's their music going to be? The, um, the phraseology or the, the acronym is CCM, Contemporary Christian Music. Julie says the theme is how much God loves us. And you know this because you go to these churches? <laughs> you, you know this how? I seldom, I, I do sometimes make a mistake and listen to Caleb. <laughs> um, or other FM Christian stations. It is my observation, I, I don't recall very often hearing heaven. I don't hear the word God, I don't hear the word Jesus, I don't hear the blood. I hear you, me, I, my, me. Are you, him, he, we're in the, the generation of pronouns, evidently. But um, it, it's an interesting observation to me that in the past, the music was uh, biblical in the sense, and I don't mean to say these songs aren't biblical. I, th I think they probably mean well, but it is my observation that the music of the last 30 years, 40 years, I'd say, I'm going to guess at a percentage, you know, it's been said that 87.5% uh, of all statistics are made up on the spot. <laughs> and he would know. <laughs> <laughs> some, lar some large portion of uh, the writers today are young. They're inexperienced. They have no depth of life, no, no trials, no tribulations. Uh, they're they're uh, theologically shallow. They have not experienced the things of life that sure. cause for a mature believer 
Now, I know Fanny Crosby, I believe, wrote over a thousand songs. And uh, she was blind. But she writes songs like Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. That's a song about heaven. Watching, waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. The theology in these older songs is tremendous. And it, it just, I, I go back to them, especially the older I get, the, the more I appreciate the depth of the, of the music and the theology in it. And I, you know, it sounds like I'm bragging on the stuff that's today. Uh, we, we know it's a hyperbole when you say it makes your ears bleed. Or perhaps you're just a liar. No. <laughs> but you're a Baptist, you shouldn't get away with that. Um, it, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard to many, yeah. to many people. So I, I, I just want to offer, yeah, go ahead. Hurry. We did hear a great rendition of Blessed Assurance. Assurance. Yeah, I played it on, uh, if anybody follows me on Facebook, there's a rendition out by, I believe the group's name is Kane, C-A-I-N. Mm -hmm. And they do a rendition of Blessed Assurance mm -hmm. that gave me goosebumps, made me cry. They do more jumping than I could do. Made me want to stand up and shout. It was an incredible rendition of Blessed Assurance. But what I love is, a contemporary group reaching back to an old song yeah. and bringing life and fresh taste to it. But, but these old songs have got life in them. They're powerful. Yeah. They're anointed of the Lord. Anyway, that's why I go back and sing this stuff. And I, I just love it. <laughs>
Did I hear my name? You can. Doesn't mean we're going to do it, but go ahead.
are continuing the series, What We Believe. We've come to part 10, it's about heaven. Now I've got a picture here that somebody took as they were entering the pearly gates. <laughs> and yet there's no pearly gate. I, I've searched the internet high and low, far and wide, left and right, top to bottom, east and west, north to south, all around. I can't find a picture of a pearly gate. The Bible says the gates are made of one pearl each. Twelve gates, twelve pearls, one pearl, got a gate. Nowhere you find golden gates, black gates, brass gates, shiny gates, white gates. Anyway, some, some people think that's what heaven's going to look like. Next picture. Some people think that's what it's going to look like. All the 24 elders bowed down, you know, surrounding the throne and the creatures and all that. I um, don't know what the green circle's for, but. I mentioned um, one of our recent times that the idea of heaven, other than the idea of God, is the greatest thought that ever occurred to the mind of man. Um, but it's difficult, if not impossible, to describe it. Now, 1 Corinthians 2 9 says, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. So no picture would do it justice. And the word descriptions that you find in the Bible about heaven, and even these people that claim to have had a dream or a vision and have gone to heaven and come back and tried to describe it all, we don't, how can you describe the eternal with things that we know that are not eternal? We have to say it's kind of like. And so anyway, it's, it's very impossible, really. Uh, I agree more and more with C.S. Lewis, who famously observed, if you read history, you will find that the Christians who did most for the present world were just those who thought most of the next. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective in this. Now, it, it seems to me, and I'm putting myself in the same accused spot. The church has not had much impact on culture. Culture, however, has deeply impacted the church. Now, if you've got any history in church at all, you know that people who are Christians today do a whole litany of things that if you'd done those 50, 75 years ago, you'd have been kicked out of the church because that wasn't Christian. So today, people can do things that the standards are different. I'm not saying that those people were pure. They were certainly more legalistic. Was anybody here raised legalistic? You know what legalistic means? Your parents were attorneys? That's not what it means. You've heard the phrase, my way or the highway. That's legalistic. Um, I was raised pretty legalistic. Uh, I've tried not to be any more legalistic than God would be. And it's pretty hard for me to determine exactly what God says no to. I know he has a real thing about attitude. And a real thing about anger. Be angry, don't sin. What did God get angry at? A few things. Misuse of his house, misuse of his name. So if you're going to get mad, get mad at the things that God gets mad at. Is God mad at sinners? No, God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Is he mad at sin? Oh, yeah. I almost made a joke there, but I don't talk that way. I was going to say mad as hell. I don't, I don't talk that way. I don't use hell. I don't use the D word, the S word. I don't talk that way. I think if Jesus was here, I don't think he'd talk that way. You do what you want. I'm, but we're supposed to be like him. I'm just saying. The, the church has work to do. If we're going to impress the world, if we're going to make a difference, then we shouldn't be just like them. 
cracks me up. We, we, we went to a pastor's conference probably 20 years ago. And they put these young kids up there to lead worship for pastors. <laughs> Skin tight jeans. They must have been expecting high water because they hit the middle of their ankle about six inches above their shoe. Couldn't afford socks. Didn't know how to do their hair, so they wore stocking caps. Holes in their clothes. Hard Rock Cafe t-shirt. All dressed up. Going to present the most important message in the world to guys who deliver the most important message in the world, guys and girls. And they're going to they're gonna look like they just crawled out of bed after a night on a binger. I try not to be too legalistic, but it's just stupid. It's, it's, can't afford them giving all their money to missions anyway it's just stylistic I hope you know there's lots of different styles I, I read something yesterday let me see if I can get it um, when your worship and praise to God is proportionate to the hell he's delivered you from. That is a glorious sound. I may not have done that quote justice, but you get the idea. That your energy and your expression of praise and worship to God Almighty should be in proportion to the hell he delivered you from. Man, that spoke to me. Um... That's one thing. The other side of that would be if you've been raised in church your whole life and you weren't delivered from a life of hell, then perhaps your love for Jesus should be over the top. But Jesus said he loves much who's been forgiven much. So the, the tendency might be for somebody that's been raised in and or around the church to take the spiritual, supernatural, awesome things of God kind of for granted. They've lost, the supernatural has lost its luster. The, the awe of God, the fear of God. And, and if you have no perspective of heaven, then no wonder the emphasis isn't here on this life. Listen. We're not trying to make the people who live in this world have a better life here. We're trying to get the people who live in this world to see that they've got a better life coming. And that is in the next life. This life is not about this life. This life is about the next life. And when you get all wrapped up and all about getting healthy and well and financially secure and stable and blah, 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 good for you. Great. But that can't be your life emphasis, not your life goal. I'm, I'm proud of people who are believers and have got it that together. They don't owe any money. They're secure. But I've discovered that you, when you're not living life on the edge, you lose sight of the miraculous power of God. When you don't know how you're going to make it, you lay that before the Lord and you pray and seek God and suddenly it works. You know that God stepped in. Now you have a relationship with the living God. I just think that the church has lost its way. We become consumed with being likable. It sounds... Uh, it probably sounds legalistic and arrogant to say I don't care what this world thinks of me. I just don't care. <laughs> what matters is I'm going to stand before God and give an account for the words I uttered, for the messages I delivered, 
for the things I said, for the passion with which I said them, for the conviction that I have about what I declare. I'm going to be held accountable for that. And you, all the listeners, are going to be held accountable for how you respond. If I got in the way and messed you up and you missed the message, then I, then I made a mistake because I'm not the message. I'm just the messenger. The message is Jesus, God and his great love. The message is about heaven. And man, if I could just get you to see how real heaven is, the things that bother you in this life would not bother you so much. I'm not saying you'd never be troubled. The Bible does say, many are the afflictions of the righteous. How's that for your word of faith, boys? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God delivers him out of them all. So you're not going to be able to muster up enough faith to have no troubles, but you should have even a little bit of faith to know Jesus loves me. I've been saved from sin and hell. I'm not in bondage to that stuff. And when I lose this life, I gain my next one, which none of the things here can compare with the glory that I'm going to share there. So it doesn't matter what goes on here. It doesn't matter who doesn't like me. It doesn't matter whether I have money or not. It doesn't matter what kind of house I live in, what kind of car I drive. It doesn't matter. We're going to be here a short time. Boy, from now... I mean, when you're as old as Arlene, good Lord. <laughs> we don't have much time left. She was telling me today she doesn't have much time left. <laughs> You've been saying that since I've known you. <laughs> yeah, <huh? laughs> Which has been a while. Since. What a gift. In 1985, Arlene drove up to the little old church, and there I was in nail bags and cutoffs, my bare white legs hanging out. She's got to be thinking, that's the pastor? Good Lord. <laughs> well, she had enough courage to come to church, and God laid it on her heart to pray for us, to bless us. Part of the time, she was a church janitor for I don't know how many years. Oh. Would come in there, she'd be scrubbing the bathrooms. Mm. Praise the Lord. I'm working my way to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> working your way to heaven. Yeah, she... <laughs> Throw her a fish. She, 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 oh, Lordy mercy. She is so funny. When you, when you see the goal and you understand the reality of it, it's not a price to pay to get there. You're willing to pay any price. You don't think about the price to pay. I don't think about what I give up. Years ago, I had an opportunity to go into worldly music. It was a hot offer. I was a young kid. I could have been a star in my own town. I don't know where they would have taken me. But I knew in my heart that wasn't right. I knew it. And I turned it down. And I'm so glad I did. I could sing any kind of music. I don't want to. I could play any kind of music. I don't want to. God gave me the gift. I gave it back. Is it for money? No. Nice to get a nickel or two now and then, but it's not, it's not the motivation. We're all going to stand before God. We're going to have to go, go to heaven and figure this out. I'm going to be effective in this life. And I think a proper view of the next world gives us a balance to keep us anchored through this life so that the storms of this life don't push you off course. Now, a thorough treatment of heaven, I don't know if that's possible. I'm not capable. There have been volumes of books written about heaven. I mean, I read commentaries. I read books. Every week I'm reading, thinking, well, I, I can't get it all in one sermon. How many, how many sermons I'm going to talk about? I don't know. But uh, I know this. Heaven is real. The afterlife is real. It's going to happen whether you believe it or not. So I'm, a, I'm one who believes that the Bible is the only authority about everything in life and certainly about the afterlife. So I'm, while you may have an interesting view of things, if it doesn't line up with the scriptures, it's just that. It's just an interesting view of things. But it doesn't affect my life one way or another. Now, 
personal anecdotes. I've read a lot of those, people who've been to heaven. You've ever read this, uh, is it 29 Minutes in Heaven? Is that the name of the book? And then uh, Heaven is for Real. I can't explain those things. I don't have to. Not my problem. God's problem. But personal anecdotes are just that. I try not to pass judgment on somebody's vision or dream or anecdotal story one way or the other. You know, I, I've discovered that there are some private things that God gives me that aren't for public consumption. Some things are just for me. And when you make them public, it causes confusion because people take your story and try to establish a theology out of an anecdote. Because we're always looking for a rule or a law or something that's stabilizing. So we're looking to try to find how your story fits and what we think we know. And then we begin to adjust what we think we know based on the input we've had. Listen, your input ought to be the word. Let that be the stabilizer. Let that determine what you think and how you feel about what you think. But some private things aren't meant for public consumption. If the view differs from the scriptures, then... The, the scriptures remain true and everything else is just an opinion. Now, I know that Joel says old men will dream dreams. Anybody here dreaming dreams? Easy, he's not that young. I'm not that old, I mean. Don, you're not 100 yet, so you've got a lot, of, a lot of room to go. Well, bless your heart. I'm trying to get as old as you are. So stay ahead of me and lead the way. Young men see visions, old men dream dreams. The Spirit of the Lord will be poured out on his handmaidens, servants and handmaidens. That's Joel. And then Peter plucks that out of Joel and applies it to Acts uh, chapter 3 in his sermon. Or 2, whatever it was. 2, I think. The point is, ever since Pentecost, through today and until the coming of Jesus, it is the day of grace. It is the day when God pours out his spirit. It is the day when God reveals things supernaturally by his spirit to people. Sometimes it's in a dream. Sometimes it's in a vision. But those are spiritually um, initiated. They're not pizza or tomato sauce. They're not hot, spicy food causing you to have troubles and have a dream or a vision. A spiritual dream or vision is something authored by God, and you kind of know the difference. I don't know if I can help you determine the difference, but always think it might not be God and ask God to confirm his word. If God speaks to you, God, throughout the Bible, you'll, you'll find that God speaks in multiples. So if you think the Lord has spoken to you about something, shown you something, a vision or a dream, ask the Lord to confirm it. How would he confirm it? Maybe somebody else will be talking in a conversation and they'll say something the Lord showed them or something that they've read in the scriptures. God has a way to confirm his word. You're, you're not going to make up some new theological angle. There's nothing new under the sun. So if God gives you a nugget, it will mesh with the scriptures and other believers will find ways through the Spirit of the Lord initiating to confirm His Word to you. I'm going to give you ten biblical descriptions of heaven. There are more than ten. I'm going to give you just these ten. This is where we'll start and we'll, we're done here. We'll, next week we're going to talk about mamas. We'll honor the mothers. But today, talk about heaven. Of course, living with Pam, it's like heaven in our house anyway. Heaven has mansions where we will dwell with Jesus, John 14. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Heaven is a place that's built for worship, Hebrews 12. You've come to Mount Zion in the city of the living God the heavenly Jerusalem, an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, 
to the spirits of just men made perfect. Matter of fact, if you just read uh, Revelation chapter 4, which we're not going to do here today, that, that's a homework for you. Just read Revelation 4. It'll take you three, four minutes. Just sit down and read it. Quiet place, just read Revelation 4. You'll get a picture of the worship of heaven. Number three, all nations and people will worship Jesus there. Revelation 7. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, tongues, standing before the throne, before the Lamb, clothed with their white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Churches that are too quiet bother me. Now, you could probably be over the top and be emotionally boisterous, but I'll, I would prefer that rather than graveyard worship. Can you just hear a throng of people at the top of their voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I mean, it should put goosebumps up and down you. Heaven, number four, will be filled with peace, joy, and praise. Revelation 7. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore, nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Number five, there's going to be a great storm in heaven. Doesn't seem reasonable, does it? The Ark of the Covenant will be there. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the Ark of His Covenant was seen in His temple. And there were lightnings, noises, thunderings, an earthquake, and great hail. Weird, huh? In heaven. Number six, Jesus leads armies clothed in white on white horses, Revelation 19. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen, White and clean followed him on white horses. Number seven, precious gemstones will adorn heaven, Revelation 21. Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper. Anybody know what color jasper is? Yeah, but interesting, even though we know that, there are jaspers of slightly different tinges, but he says this one's clear. Red and clear. I mean, it's odd. Huh? He's trying to describe an eternal thing with non-eternal words and things that we know. The second was sapphire. What color is sapphire? Third, chalcedony, or actually called chalcedony, which is kind of a, um, it can be clear, it can be uh, amber. Yeah, it's got different hues to it. Chalcedony. The fourth is emerald. We know that's a green. Fifth is sardonyx. The sixth is sardius. The seventh is chrysolite. The eighth is beryl. The ninth is topaz. The tenth is chrysophase. The eleventh is jacinth. And the twelfth is amethyst. I can't imagine these colors. Number eight. Heaven will have pearl gates and streets. Or is it street of gold? The Bible, the, the King James says street, not plural. Anyway, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. How big was the oyster that had that? 
And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Pure gold, like transparent glass? I mean, I, I, I can't, I, I know gold is gold colored, not clear as glass. It doesn't compute in my little brain. It goes on to say that in heaven there will be no more sun or moon. The glory of God and the light of the Lamb will be its illumination. The city had no need of the sun or of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God illuminated it. The Lamb is its light, and the nations of those who are saved shall walk in its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory and honor into it. Its gates shall not be shut at all by day. There shall be no night there. So there's a new Jerusalem that comes down that evidently sits in place of the old Jerusalem. Number nine, tree of life is in heaven. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. I, I don't know what that means. Any ideas? Arthur, what do you think we pay you for? Wait a minute, you pay me? Everybody been missing. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Well, we don't know how that works. We just know that's what the Bible says. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Oh, wait a minute. There's a part I play, to him who overcomes? What does overcoming mean? If I don't overcome, what does that mean? What does that look like? So I have to overcome. So I have to endure. I have to decide whose team I'm on and play for that team. I don't get to be on the opposing team. I read something by, um, remember Flip Wilson? You cannot shack up with the devil and expect God to pay the rent. <laughs> oh, our theologian, Flip Wilson. <laughs> the light of God in heaven, Revelation 22. They shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. There shall be no night there, no need. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now, every beautiful description of heaven will, will come to fruition and far exceed our greatest expectations. Forever and ever, we will rule and reign as joint heirs with Christ. Heaven is a real place. The word heaven is found 276 times in the New Testament alone. It's the dwelling place of God. His throne is there. The angels are there. Jesus is there. All the redeemed throughout the ages are there. Heaven is a place of no mores. No more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. There will be no more separation because death will be conquered. Blessed, are holy, blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them, the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. Now, why do we talk about heaven? Because we want you to go. There's only one way to get there, only one way to get access, and that's through Jesus Christ and him alone. No other possible way for you to get to heaven but by the Son of God. Going to heaven is a one-way trip. If you die before Jesus Christ's second advent or his return, you will go directly to heaven and be in the presence of God. And maybe more about that next week. Now, before I go any further, I want to just share Wayne, if I may. Palm Sunday morning, about 2 or 3 in the morning, Wayne is laying in bed thinking, I've had a lot of near-death experiences. I've had a lot of close calls. And I have never really had a, a, a genuine um, connection. I mean, I, I love God, I go to church and all that, but I've never really officially done the salvation thing. I've never really prayed and asked Christ 
Now, you've heard a million sermons. Maybe not going to be quite a million. I know that every time you've been here, I somehow have found a way to talk about getting saved, right? So Wayne is laying there thinking, I'm, uh, how old, 80? I'm 80 years old. I'm waiting for a bolt of lightning. He says, uh, how long is it ever going to come? How long am I going to wait? So he said, well, if not now, then when? So he said, right then and there, I decided that I was giving myself and all of my sin to Jesus. And he said, it was like a ton of bricks rolled off of me. Yeah, amen. The weight was lifted. The weight was lifted. The weight of sin. When you're born again, the Spirit of God comes... It's, I call it the, the great exchange. Your life for his. My burden is light. My yoke is easy, Jesus said. Romans 10, 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. We believe with our hearts, and so we are made right with God. And we declare with our mouths that we believe, and so we are saved. Acts 16, 31, they said to him, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. Now, if you never see heaven, you will most certainly see hell. And that also is a one-way trip. There is no return. There's no coming back. No matter what our Catholic friends will try to tell you, there's no in-between land. There's no purgatory. There's no Bible to support that. If the church hadn't been going broke, they would have never come up with that idea. That was a way to raise money. It's theologically unstable and unconscionable and a perversion of the gospel. You go through Jesus or you're not getting in. Good works <laughs> won't save you. We don't work for the Lord to get saved. We work for the Lord because we are saved. We want to do good works and show that Christ lives in us. So may the Lord help you live that way. Those with choice should choose heaven. Those without choice, God will judge fairly. I say that because you may think, well, what about all those people on some backside of the earth somewhere who have never heard? God knows how to deal with that. That isn't your problem. Your problem is you have heard. And then what are you going to do with that? That's your problem. Your problem is not somebody on the back side of the desert someplace who's never heard. Your problem is that I've heard and now I must decide. The gospel presses you to a decision. You cannot be uh, spiritually neutral like uh, spiritual Switzerland. You've got to make a decision. You have to choose sides. We're in a war and I'm on the Lord's team. I hope you are too. I would suspect that's why you're in this room today. So there's your marching orders. Go somewhere, express joy, generosity, goodness, loving kindness, bless somebody, and look for an opportunity to talk about what matters. What matters? Take the subject they give you and find a way to segue to a spiritual construct. Talk about things that really matter. God will give you that skill. If you love people and know that heaven is real, and hell is real. And don't want anybody to go to hell. But want everybody you can get a hold of to go to heaven with you. Then you're going to be about that business. No matter what other business you're in. Take care of your other business. Then ask God for a way to get into his business. So that you can do his work. Now God will show you how to do that. Everybody in the room has probably been healed at some point in your life. We pray for continued health. May the healing of God continue in your physical frame. You've all been discouraged at some time or another, but God has delivered you and brought you peace and comfort, and you're stable today. Somebody that you know is not. They're not peaceful. They're not stable. Ask the Lord to help you have wisdom to know how to speak to them, to bring life to them. Do the work of a believer. We're not just here biding our time until we get to go to heaven. We are here working for the Lord, but I don't call it work. I'm thrilled to get to do what I do. And I hope you get to do things that, are, that you know that God is using you in them. 
So tomorrow, most of you go to work or school or whatever you do. Ask the Lord every day, Lord, what can I do today to serve your kingdom? When I'm on the way to a piano tuning, I'm praying. God, how can I work today for you? What can I do today that will bless you? So I tune a piano, then I play How Great Thou Art. I play In the Garden. I play Amazing Grace. And who knows, maybe Old Rugged Cross. I, I play songs that I know have life in them. And then God takes it from there and then opens conversations. So may the Lord somehow direct each of us, wherever we go, whatever we do. We're pointing people to heaven. Amen? Lord, bless your word today and bless us to this world. And we ask your blessing on the elements of the communion that we take in a moment to celebrate you and your disciples that last supper you had before you were murdered, crucified by the Romans at the insistence of the Jews who rejected you. But today, while we recognize how grievous and awful that was, that you willingly, out of love, paid that tremendous price to redeem us who were nobody, no heritage, no pedigree. We didn't belong to the people of God. We were all children of sin, children of the devil, until you came along and rescued us. Somewhere back in our lineage, somebody heard the gospel and got my parents saved. And they took me to church. And you placed a call on my life. And here I am today, at 76 years old, proclaiming the good news, the great gospel of Jesus. Lord, you have plans for all of us and our children and our grandchildren for generations until you come. Lord, we thank you that you paid that price to redeem a people. And we are your people. We bless you for that. You've loved us, brought us to yourself. You've healed us. You've forgiven us. You've redeemed us. You've claimed us as your own, incredible as that is. So, Lord, we bless you today, and we rejoice in the taking of the elements of the bread and the cup to celebrate what you did for our redemption. We give you praise for all this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen. Guys, would you come and serve the elements for the church to receive together?